Part 1, Sections 1 through 10 of A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and the Beautiful by Edmund Burke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and the Beautiful by Edmund Burke. Part 1. Section 1. Novelty. The first and the simplest emotion which we discover in the human mind is curiosity. By curiosity I mean whatever desire we have for, or whatever pleasure we take in, novelty. We see children perpetually running from place to place to hunt out something new. They catch with great eagerness, and with very little choice, at whatever comes before them. Their attention is engaged by everything, because everything has, in that stage of life, the charm of novelty to recommend it. But as those things which engage us merely by their novelty cannot attach us for any length of time, curiosity is the most superficial of all the affections. It changes its object perpetually. It has an appetite which is very sharp but very easily satisfied, and it has always an appearance of giddiness, restlessness, and anxiety. Curiosity, from its nature, is a very active principle. It quickly runs over the greatest part of its objects, and soon exhausts the variety which is commonly to be met with in nature. The same things make frequent returns and they return with less and less of any agreeable effect. In short, the occurrences of life, by the time we come to know it a little, would be incapable of affecting the mind with any other sensations than those of loathing and weariness, if many things were not adapted to affect the mind by means of other powers besides novelty in them, and of other passions besides curiosity in ourselves. These powers and passions shall be considered in their place. But whatever these powers are, or upon what principle soever they affect the mind, it is absolutely necessary that they should not be exerted in those things which a daily and vulgar use have brought into a stale, unaffecting familiarity. Some degree of novelty must be one of the materials in every instrument which works upon the mind, and curiosity blends itself more or less with all our passions. Section 2. Pain and Pleasure It seems, then, necessary towards moving the passions of people advanced in life to any considerable degree, that the objects designed for that purpose, besides their being in some measure new, should be capable of exciting pain or pleasure from other causes. Pain and Pleasure are simple ideas, incapable of definition. People are not liable to be mistaken in their feelings, but they are very frequently wrong in the names they give them, and in their reasonings about them. Many are of opinion that pain arises necessarily from the removal of some pleasure, as they think pleasure does from the ceasing or diminution of some pain. For my part, I am rather inclined to imagine that pain and pleasure, in their most simple and natural manner of affecting, are each of a positive nature, and by no means necessarily dependent on each other for their existence. The human mind is often, and I think it is for the most part, in a state neither of pain nor pleasure, which I call a state of indifference. When I am carried from this state into a state of actual pleasure, it does not appear necessary that I should pass through the medium of any sort of pain. If in such a state of indifference or ease or tranquility, or call it what you please, you were to be suddenly entertained with a concert of music, or suppose some object of a fine shape and bright lively colors to be presented before you, or imagine your smell is gratified with the fragrance of a rose, or if, without any previous thirst, you were to drink of some pleasant kind of wine, or to taste of some sweetmeat without being hungry, 
in all the several senses of hearing, smelling, and tasting, you undoubtedly find a pleasure, yet, if I inquire into the state of your mind previous to these gratifications, you will hardly tell me that they found you in any kind of pain. Or, having satisfied these several senses with their several pleasures, will you say that any pain has succeeded, though the pleasure is absolutely over? Suppose, on the other hand, a man in the same state of indifference to receive a violent blow, or to drink of some bitter potion, or to have his ears wounded with some harsh and grating sound. Here is no removal of pleasure, and yet here is felt, his every sense which is affected, a pain very distinguishable. It may be said, perhaps, that the pain in these cases had its rise from the removal of the pleasure which the man enjoyed before, though that pleasure was of so low a degree as to be perceived only by the removal. But this seems to me a subtlety that is not discoverable in nature. For if, previous to the pain, I do not feel any actual pleasure, I have no reason to judge that any such thing exists since pleasure is only pleasure as it is felt. The same may be said of pain, and with equal reason. I can never persuade myself that pleasure and pain are mere relations, which can only exist as they are contrasted. But I think I can discern clearly that there are positive pains and pleasures which do not at all depend upon each other. Nothing is more certain to my own feelings than this. There is nothing which I can distinguish in my mind with more clearness than the three states of indifference, of pleasure, and of pain. Every one of these I can perceive without any sort of idea of its relation to anything else. Caius is afflicted with a fit of the colic. This man is actually in pain. Stretch Caius upon the rack, he will feel a much greater pain. But does this pain of the rack arise from the removal of any pleasure? Or is the fit of the colic a pleasure or a pain just as we are pleased to consider it? Section 3. The difference between the removal of pain and positive pleasure. We shall carry this proposition yet a step further. We shall venture to propose that pain and pleasure are not only not necessarily dependent for their existence on their mutual diminution or removal, but that, in reality, the diminution or ceasing of pleasure does not operate like positive pain, and that the removal or diminution of pain in its effect has very little resemblance to positive pleasure. Footnote. Mr. Locke, Essay on Human Understanding, L to C20, Section 16, thinks that the removal or lessening of a pain is considered and operates as a pleasure, and the loss or diminishing of pleasure as a pain. It is this opinion which we consider here. End footnote. The former of these propositions will, I believe, be much more readily allowed than the latter, because it is very evident that pleasure, when it has run its career, sets us down very nearly where it found us. Pleasure of every kind quickly satisfies, and, when it is over, we relapse into indifference, or rather, we fall into a soft tranquillity which is tinged with the agreeable color of the former sensation. I own it is not at first view so apparent that the removal of a great pain does not resemble positive pleasure, but let us recollect in what state we have found our minds upon escaping some imminent danger or on being released from the severity of some cruel pain. We have on such occasions found, if I am not much mistaken, the temper of our minds in a tenor very remote from that which attends the presence of positive pleasure. We have found them in a state of much sobriety, impressed with a sense of awe, in a sort of tranquillity shadowed with horror. The fashion of the countenance and the gesture of the body on such occasions is so correspondent to this state of mind that any person, a stranger to the cause of the appearance, would rather judge us under some consternation than in the enjoyment of anything like positive pleasure. 
as when a wretch, who, conscious of his crime, pursued for murder from his native clime, just gained some frontier, breathless, pale, amazed, all gaze, all wonder. Iliad, 480. This striking appearance of the man whom Homer supposes to have just escaped an imminent danger, the sort of mixed passion of terror and surprise with which he affects the spectators, paints very strongly the manner in which we find ourselves affected upon occasions any way similar. For when we have suffered from any violent emotion, the mind naturally continues in something like the same condition, after the cause which first produced it has ceased to operate. The tossing of the sea remains after the storm, and when this remain of horror has entirely subsided, all the passion which the accident raised subsides along with it, and the mind returns to its usual state of indifference. In short, pleasure, I mean anything either in the inward sensation or in the outward appearance, like pleasure from a positive cause, has never, I imagine, its origins from the removal of pain or danger. Section 4. Of Delight and Pleasure as Opposed to Each Other But shall we therefore say that the removal of pain or its diminution is always simply painful? Or affirm that the cessation or the lessening of pleasure is always attended itself with a pleasure? By no means. What I advance is no more than this. First, that there are pleasures and pains of a positive and independent nature. And secondly, that the feeling which results from the ceasing or diminution of pain does not bear a sufficient resemblance to positive pleasure to have it considered as of the same nature or to entitle it to be known by the same name. And thirdly, that upon the same principle, the removal or qualification of pleasure has no resemblance to positive pain. It is certain that the former feeling, the removal or moderation of pain, has something in it far from distressing or disagreeable in its nature. This feeling, in many cases so agreeable, but in all so different from positive pleasure, has no name which I know, but that hinders not its being a very real one, and very different from all others. It is most certain that every species of satisfaction or pleasure, how different soever in its manner of affecting, is of a positive nature in the mind of him who feels it. The affection is undoubtedly positive, but the cause may be, as in this case it certainly is, a sort of privation and it is very reasonable that we should distinguish by some term two things so distinct in nature as a pleasure that is such simply and without any relation from that pleasure which cannot exist without a relation, and that too a relation to pain. Very extraordinary it would be if these affections, so distinguishable in their causes, so different in their effects, should be confounded with each other because vulgar use has ranged them under the same general title. Whenever I have occasion to speak of this species of relative pleasure, I call it delight, and I shall take the best care I can to use that word in no other sense. I am satisfied the word is not commonly used in this appropriated signification, but I thought it better to take up a word already known, and to limit its signification then to introduce a new one, which would not perhaps incorporate so well with the language. I should never have presumed the least alteration in our words, if the nature of the language, framed for the purposes of business, rather than those of philosophy, and the nature of my subject, that leads me out of the common track of discourse, did not in a manner necessitate me to it. I shall make use of this liberty with all possible caution. As I make use of the word delight to express the sensation which accompanies the removal of pain or danger, so when I speak of positive pleasure, I shall for the most part call it simply pleasure. Section 5. 
joy and grief. It must be observed that the cessation of pleasure affects the mind three ways. If it simply ceases after having continued a proper time, the effect is indifference. If it be abruptly broken off, there ensues an uneasy sense called disappointment. If the object be so totally lost that there is no chance of enjoying it again, a passion arises in the mind, which is called grief. Now there is none of these, not even grief, which is the most violent, that I think has any resemblance to positive pain. The person who grieves suffers his passion to grow upon him, he indulges it, he loves it. But this never happens in the case of actual pain, which no man ever willingly endured for any considerable time. That grief should be willingly endured, though far from a simply pleasing sensation, is not so difficult to be understood. It is the nature of grief to keep its object perpetually in its eye, to present it in its most pleasurable views, to repeat all the circumstances that attend it, even to the last minuteness, to go back to every particular enjoyment, to dwell upon each, and to find a thousand new perfections in all that were not sufficiently understood before. In grief, the pleasure is still uppermost, and the afflictions we suffer has no resemblance to absolute pain, which is always odious, and which we endeavor to shake off as soon as possible. The Odyssey of Homer, which abounds with so many natural and affecting images, has none more striking than those which Menelaus raises of the calamitous fate of his friends and his own manner of feeling it. He owns, indeed, that he often gives himself some intermission from such melancholy reflections, but he observes, too, that melancholy as they are, they give him pleasure. Still in short intervals of pleasing woe, regardful of the friendly dues I owe, I to the glorious dead forever dear, indulge the tribute of a grateful tear. Homer, Odyssey, 100. On the other hand, when we recover our health, when we escape an imminent danger, is it with joy that we are affected? The sense on these occasions is far from that smooth and voluptuous satisfaction which the assured prospect of pleasure bestows. The delight which arises from the modifications of pain confesses the stock from whence it sprung, in its solid, strong, and severe nature. Section 6. Of the Passions Which Belong to Self-Preservation most of the ideas which are capable of making a powerful impression on the mind, whether simply of pain or pleasure, or of the modifications of those, may be reduced very nearly to these two heads, self-preservation and society, to the ends of one or the other of which all our passions are calculated to answer. The passions which concern self-preservation turn mostly on pain or danger. The ideas of pain, sickness, and death fill the mind with strong emotions of horror, but life and health, though they put us in a capacity of being affected with pleasure, make no such impression by the simple enjoyment. The passions, therefore, which are conversant about the preservation of the individual turn chiefly on pain and danger, and they are the most powerful of all the passions. Section 7. Of the Sublime. Whatever is fitted in any sort to excite the ideas of pain and danger, that is to say, whatever is in any sort terrible, or is conversant about terrible objects, or operates in a manner analogous to terror, is a source of the sublime, that is, it is productive of the strongest emotion which the mind is capable of feeling. I say the strongest emotion, because I am satisfied the ideas of pain 
are much more powerful than those which enter on the part of pleasure. Without all doubt, the torments which we may be made to suffer are much greater in their effect on the body and mind than any pleasures which the most learned voluptuary could suggest, or than the liveliest imagination, and the most sound and exquisitely sensible body could enjoy. Nay, I am in great doubt whether any man could be found who would earn a life of the most perfect satisfaction at the price of ending it in the torments which justice inflicted in a few hours on the late unfortunate regicide in France. But as pain is stronger in its operation than pleasure, so death is in general a much more affecting idea than pain, because there are very few pains, however exquisite, which are not preferred to death. Nay, what generally makes pain itself, if I may say so, more painful is, that it is considered as an emissary of this king of terrors. When danger or pain press too nearly, they are incapable of giving any delight, and are simply terrible. But at certain distances, and with certain modifications, they may be, and they are, delightful as we every day experience. The cause of this I shall endeavor to investigate hereafter. Section 8. Of the Passions Which Belong to Society. The other head under which I class our passions is that of society, which may be divided into two sorts. One, the society of the sexes, which answers the purpose of propagation. And next, that more general society, which we have with men and with other animals, and which we may in some sort be said to have even with the inanimate world, the passions belonging to the preservation of the individual turn wholly on pain and danger. Those which belong to generation have their origin in gratifications and pleasures. The pleasure most directly belonging to this purpose is of a lively character, rapturous and violent and confessedly the highest pleasure of sense. Yet the absence of this so great an enjoyment scarce amounts to an uneasiness, and, except at particular times, I do not think it affects at all. When men describe in what manner they are affected by pain and danger, they do not dwell on the pleasure of health and of the comfort of security, and then lament on the loss of these satisfactions. The whole turns upon the actual pains and horrors which they endure. But if you listen to the complaints of a forsaken lover, you observe that he insists largely on the pleasures which he enjoyed, or hoped to enjoy, and on the perfection of the object of his desires. It is the loss which is always uppermost in his mind. The violent effects produced by love which has sometimes been even wrought up to madness, is no objection to the rule which we seek to establish. When men have suffered their imaginations to be long affected with any idea, it so wholly engrosses them as to shut out by degrees almost every other, and to break down every partition of the mind which would confine it. Any idea is sufficient for the purpose, as is evident from the infinite variety of causes which give rise to madness. But this at most can only prove that the passion of love is capable of producing very extraordinary effects, not that its extraordinary emotions have any connection with positive pain. Section 9. The final cause of the difference between the passions belonging to self-preservation and those which regard the society of the sexes. The final cause of the difference in character between the passions which regard self-preservation and those which are directed to the multiplication of the species will illustrate the foregoing remarks yet further. And it is, I imagine, worthy of observation even upon its own account. As the performance of our duties of every kind depends upon life, and the performing them with vigor and efficacy depends upon health, we are very strongly affected with whatever threatens the destruction of either. 
but as we were not made to acquiesce in life and health, the simple enjoyment of them is not attended with any real pleasure, lest, satisfied with that, we should give ourselves over to indolence and inaction. On the other hand, the generation of mankind is a great purpose, and it is requisite that men should be animated to the pursuit of it by some great incentive. It is therefore attended with a very high pleasure, but as it is by no means designed to be our constant business, it is not fit that the absence of this pleasure should be attended with any considerable pain. The difference between men and brutes in this point seems to be remarkable. Men are at all times pretty equally disposed to the pleasures of love, because they are to be guided by reason in the time and manner of indulging them. Had any great pain arisen from the want of this satisfaction, reason, I am afraid, would find great difficulties in the performance of its office. But brutes that obey laws, in the execution of which their own reason has but little share, have their stated seasons. At such times it is not improbable that the sensation from the want is very troublesome, because the end must be then answered, or be missed in many, perhaps forever, as the inclination returns only with its season. Section 10. Of Beauty. The passion which belongs to generation merely as such is lust only. This is evident in brutes, whose passions are more unmixed, and which pursue their purposes more directly than ours. The only distinction they observe with regard to their mates is that of sex. It is true that they stick severally to their own species in preference to all others, but this preference, I imagine, does not arise from any sense of beauty which they find in their species, as Mr. Addison supposes, but from a law of some other kind, to which they are subject. In this we may fairly conclude, from their apparent want of choice amongst those objects to which the barriers of their species have confined them. But man, who is a creature adapted to a greater variety and intricacy of relation, connects with the general passion the idea of some social qualities which direct and heighten the appetite which he has in common with all other animals. And as he is not designed like them to live at large, it is fit that he should have something to create a preference and to fix his choice, and this in general should be some sensible quality. As this, no other can so quickly, so powerfully, or so surely produce its effect. The object, therefore, of this mixed passion, which we call love, is the beauty of the sex. Men are carried to the sex in general, as it is the sex and by the common law of nature, but they are attached to particulars by personal beauty. I call beauty a social quality, for where women and men, and not only they, but when other animals give us a sense of joy and pleasure in beholding them, and there are many that do so, they inspire us with sentiments of tenderness and affection towards their persons. We like to have them near us, and we enter willingly into a kind of relation with them, unless we should have strong reasons to the contrary. But to what end in many cases this was designed, I am unable to discover, for I see no greater reason for a connection between man and several animals who are attired in so engaging a manner than between him and some others who entirely want this attraction, or possess it in a far weaker degree. But it is probable that Providence did not make even this distinction, but with a view to some great end though we cannot perceive distinctly what it is, as his wisdom is not our wisdom, nor our ways his ways. End of Part 1, Sections 1 through 10 of A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and the Beautiful by Edmund Burke.